Hello, and welcome to Sunday. Um, we re released a beta reading video yesterday. I uh, got all kinds of lovely feedback. A lot of people uh, hit the um, hit the deal and started reading. Um, it was it was very exciting and very fun watching my phone blow up with all these lovely notifications. So that's a lot of fun. Um, I know uh, some of you have gone on ahead and read on ahead, so uh, don't don't drop any spoilers in the comments. But um, or if you do, then then hint. You know that's cool. So anyway, um, so yeah, it's just it's been very exciting and very good, uh, and the the edit is well underway. Um, so <laughs> I am I'm in edit edit mode like crazy uh whoo yeah and wow the suggestions and the feedback has been it's been really good and at the same time parts of it have been very challenging too so anyway just trying to figure it out um uh boo boo uh we have a kitten on the prowl um so if the video goes out you know what's happening um oh, okay maybe we will just go over here where i can hold it there we go. Okay, um, so different view today, um, and I hope you guys are having a really wonderful weekend. Okay, so chapter 48, Unexpected Find. Okay, so last time, chapter 27, um, we were really getting our bearings, and we were figuring all about the um, sabotage. Okay, so now we're picking up from that. Okay, chapter 48, Unexpected Find. Setting up the rock slabs to drop on their cots was the easiest sabotage to get started. I just created a hundred more miners, gave them directions, and turned them loose. They would be done in plenty of time before I finished my exit tunnel. Next, I started messing with their charms. Every charm has a round space, has a small round space that holds the neutral magic. So I made another bunch of miners, and told them to attack the walls, and let all that power escape. The idea worked, but it was really rough on the miners. Marius wore his charms around his waist, so I had to fight his aura and the magic embedded in the charm in order to change it. I lost the magic in over 50 miners before I succeeded. When I was done, all of Marius's charms, including his shield charm, would no longer hold any power. Getting to Carl's charms was a lot harder. He stored them in a special place on a special pouch on the inside of his left thigh. Having them between his legs made it extra hard to get to his aura. Plus, his aura was a lot more powerful than Marius's, and it seemed to be constantly churning. I burned through another 50 miners, but all I was able to sabotage was his shield charm. I decided to wait and see how well the Marius suck balls were going to do before attempting anything more. The sucker rune was a lot more complex than anything I tackled yet. It looked like a circular row of teeth leading to a drain in the middle. It looked nasty and mean, sort of like the Sarlacc pit in the Star Wars, or maybe the mouth of one of those weird fish that live in the bottom of the ocean that sucks your blood. Ooh. Whoever made the sucker circle had added extra decoy lines, but I could see they didn't have any flow, so I took them out. I also closely examined the sucker rune tattoos on Carl and Marius. They had a whole outside area, like lips around the teeth. However, their tattoos had a lot less teeth. I decided to put both runes together and hope for the best. Once I had the basic lines together, I went back and adjusted them to show the direction of the flow. I made the lines like I was using a calligraphy pen, and when I was done, it looked kind of pretty in a deadly, I will suck your blood kind of way. From there, I made a ball and put the skull of the Day of the Dead on it. I decorated it with lampreys, ticks, mosquitoes, and leeches. It ended up looking really drab though, so I went back and added pretty colors to all those blood suckers. For the left eye socket, I added the sucker rune, and for the right eye socket, I used an image of Marius. I skinned the whole thing with a thousand triangles, gave it directions, and turned it loose for its test run. The results were spectacular. It inhaled, sucking a thick rope of magic out of Marius in about a second. The whole thing grew about ten times bigger before it popped and vented all its magic into the air. 
Marius and Carl didn't seem all that rotten, not compared to Big Ugly and his crew, but the magic the Marius suckballs were pulling out was just plain awful. It was slimy, nasty, and rotten to the core. I couldn't believe Marius could hold all that inside him without going nuts. The speed at which it happened was a problem, though. I needed more unnoticeable sip mists. I needed more unnoticeable mosquito sipping and less vampire ripping your neck apart. I subdivided the triangles until I had about 8,000, made a new test ball, and turned it loose with new instructions. This time it pulled his magic slowly and steadily and grew about 50 times bigger before popping. That was perfect. I took one of the skull teeth and made it my duplicator, and one of the other teeth became my resizer. Penny saved the template, and then I duplicated a couple hundred of them. I chose one ball and made him the lead. I told him to have three sucker balls going all the time and to let me know when he was down to 20 balls left. Three sucker balls were powered up. Three sucker balls powered up and began pulling from Marius, but he didn't seem to notice a thing. I kept an eye, eye on them for a while, but everything looked like it was working nicely. I wasn't the only one powering up. Carl seemed to be getting a lot better on his body magic stuffing and started picking up the pace. He went through the students from the middle row and then started on the back row. As he moved along, I realized he didn't have everyone. The gay guy and some of the women that had flirted with me were missing. I could only hope they'd escaped. Jeff the grappler, Paul, who'd been Annabeth's first row back fight, and Edward, who'd fought with axes, were all present though, and they all ended up a pile of dust on the ground. Seeing people I knew get the life sucked out of them made me sick. Sure, the back row had been a bit mouthy, but they didn't deserve this, not even a little. Marius got bored, so his games became more intense. He tried to get them to seriously maim and hurt each other for the privilege of being last in the circle. Jeff almost died from having the other guys stand on him, and Carl had to break it up. Not that Carl actually cared about Jeff. He just wanted him to be alive and full of magic when he stepped into the sucker circle. Carl had to step in again when Marius played the game Fingers for Life. He gave them knives and told them they'd get an extra hour of life for every finger they presented him. The fingers could be their own or from another student. Carl put an end to that game as the blood was causing a huge mess and one of the students was in danger of bleeding out. After that, he told Marius he couldn't play games with knives anymore. Marius didn't seem upset at all. Instead, he seemed excited about coming up with new games that were just as bad, but not as messy. Marius wasn't the only one interacting with the students. Carl had conversations with many of them, and it was always about House Louisville. He wanted to know about the original battle with the house, as well as our exchange of reconciliation. He especially zeroed in on everything they noticed and surmised about our abilities. They came up, if they came up with a new nugget of information, he wrote it down in his little notepad. He made it clear he hated our house and what we'd done to Isabel, so anything they could tell him would gain them a few more moments of life. With this kind of incentive, they told him everything. They told him stuff they'd seen, stuff they'd figured out, even stuff they made up. Carl cross-examined them, and he was pretty good at figuring out if they were lying to him. He dealt with that harshly and quickly brought the others in line. In addition to the students, Carl drained all the artifacts in the room. I was very glad I hadn't staked my escape on coming up behind a crate. Carl had all the empty crates hauled away, and soon the room was looking pretty bare. Time passed. I snuggled Bermuda and his purrs and love kept me sane. Emotionally, I was all over the place. I was hopeful that everything would work out, sad at the loss of life above me, angry at Carl and Marius, and lonely for missing Tyler and the rest of the house. Through it all, Bermuda was my rock. He loved me unconditionally and accepted however I was at the moment. He gave me hope and determination, as there was no damn way I was going to die down here and take Bermuda with me. 
I started working on my other soul creations while I waited. I redid my flashers and bashers and got them up over 15,000 triangles. T and his grove already had lots of detail in the wood and all his healing flower runes, so I didn't need to add any triangles to him. Red was already full of details, but I did another. I did add some triangles to the background part of his hexagon. It didn't seem to make much difference over it all, but it did give him some extra sparkle and he liked that. My escape tunnel progressed and soon I was able to lay down while I waited for it to finish. The biggest boost for my efforts came from the Marius Suckballs. They create a lot of magic for the granny godmothers to harvest, which meant I had more magic to spend. I used my extra capacity to finish sabotaging the rest of Carl's charms. I made sure all my miners were in tip-top shape and full of magic before I started adding more. I had over 3,000 miners digging through the rock, and I was adding more all the time. I had no idea how long I had been down here, but Carl and Marius finally finished up the last of the students and then sat down to have a long discussion. That was unusual, as both of them really didn't talk to each other that much. Marius whined and talked at Carl a lot, but that wasn't a discussion. Afterwards, Penny called a meeting of her own and filled us in on everything he'd heard. Everything she'd heard. I've got bad news, bad news, and maybe good news, she said. What do you want to hear first? Let's hear the bad news, I sighed. The bad news is that Carl is completely obsessed with the house, Penny said. I think we knew that already, I noted. Yes, we did, she nodded, but we didn't realize how obsessed he was and how it affected his plans. He's been gathering information on everyone in the house, their strengths, possible weaknesses, and he's now formulated individual strategies to deal with them. That's not good, Eggie said. It's one thing to show up on a battlefield and try to win against whoever shows up. It's another thing to know exactly who you're fighting against and arrive fully prepared for their best attacks. Carl just got a lot more dangerous to us. I agree, I said. Penny, did he talk about what his plans were? How exactly is he going to find us? Penny shook her head. No, he didn't go into details. He knows that Annabeth is a sonic mage, though, and he's figured out that Sandy and John have merged their powers. He's aware of John's golem form, and he knows they will be bringing fire and earth against him. Well, damn, I said. That's a lot of information to have. How did he get all that? I know he's talked to Ken's school, but I wouldn't have thought they would have known everything about us. I'm not sure, Penny shrugged. I do know he's found some of the videos where Sandy and John have fought before. They were older fights before the gathering, but they still show their powers in action. He's been studying them to see how they both react and how powerful they both are. I would certainly classify that as bad news, I sighed. So what's the other bad news? Well, apparently there are two other groups of rotten mages. They both hold up here in Louisville, and there's been an uneasy truce between everyone. Oliver is the leader of the smaller group, and Perry leads the larger one. Apparently they both They've both seen what taking too much magic can do to a mage, so they both put out the word that they are not attacking anyone at the moment. The truce has held up a lot longer than Carl thought it would, and he's been wary of taking the fight to them. Up to this point, he's been worried about how much power it would take to break up their defenses versus how much power he'd get from it overall. That explains why this whole rotten mage battle royale thing has been so quiet, I said. We'd figured something had to be up, or they'd have killed each other already. So I'm guessing the bad news is he's now ready to attack them? Yes, Penny replied. He's anxious to try out his new powers and see just how well they perform. He's going to attack Oliver's group first, as it's smaller and less risky. If it works, though, it's going to give him a lot more power. That's the bad news. So what's the maybe good news, Eggie asked. The maybe good news is he's attacking someone else. It's possible that Carl is wrong about what he's trying. Maybe he'll attack Oliver and it won't go well. Maybe Oliver ends up draining him. If so, we can get out of here and go home. We'll have still have to deal with Oliver and Perry, but at least we can do it with the rest of our crew. Or better, Oliver and Carl knock each other out 
and we don't have to deal with either one of them, I said hopefully. It could happen, Penny agreed, but it didn't sound like she really thought it would. Carl and Marius had a meal, prepped for battle, and then headed out. Neither one of them had working shield charms, so I was hopeful that would be a nasty surprise for them. While they were gone, I found myself pacing the floor of my throne room. I was anxious, hopeful, and nervous. If Carl died, I was free. If he came back with even more power, that would suck. I finally settled down and started making a feather dot. I gave it one triangle pass before letting Penny save the template and call. I gave it one triangle pass before letting Penny save the template and calling it done. The feather dot was just for Bermuda to chase, so it didn't need to be battle ready. I didn't want to forget Mr. Tubbles, so I started on a bedazzle dot next. I was almost done when Carl and Marius came back, and they didn't come back alone. They had seven mages with them that were brimming with rotten magic. Damn, it looked like Carl had won. That was just rotten luck. And the worst part was, these mages were filled with stolen magic. Between them, they had the magic of at least 20 mages. All of them were a bit twitchy, but three of them were starting to go crazy from too much power. That was so not good. Not good at all. It wasn't just the captured mages that were twitchy. Marius must have absorbed a lot of magic from the fight because he was wound up and couldn't calm down. Carl started pulling magic from him and packing it into his body, but Marius kept boun bouncing around the room and wouldn't stay still. He kept yelling stuff, but I couldn't understand him. Apparently the fight went well, Penny translated. Carl made Oliver his bitch and totally spanked his ass. Then someone else got feisty and got their ass handed to them. Now those hoe bags know their place, and Marius is going to do them till they bleed. Thank you, Penny, I said, raising my hand in protest. I think that's enough. I get the idea. Let me know if you hear anything specific about the fight, like how... Carl used his powers to win. Penny nodded and went back to listening. This just sucked. Like sucked, sucked, sucked. The last thing I needed was Carl getting more powerful. Well, if Marius had too much energy, then I'd be happy to take some from him. I told my head Marius sucked ball to double the number of balls sucking his energy. Marius still didn't seem to notice it. Notice, so I doubled it again from 6 to 12. Between the extra magic the suck balls were pulling and the new rotten ores of the captured mages, the whole place was starting to get really rank. It was even getting nasty down where I was, so I doubled the number of greeny godmothers and brought more of them down with me. Then I realized I didn't have to pull magic from Marius. I could pull it from the captured mages directly. They had the sucker rune tattoo after all. I modified my sucker balls so I could pull from them rather than Marius and duplicated a whole bunch of them. I had to stop before I went too far as there was just too much rotten magic in the air. Even the grannies cleaning it, even with the grannies cleaning at full power, the air was becoming too toxic for them to handle. Since I had even more magic, I made more miners and increased my tunneling speed. I dug through 12 feet of rock, only six more to go. I was restless and I was getting a bad feeling about this, but I forced myself to focus. I didn't want to blow it now. Instead, I went back and finished my bedazzle dot. Penny saved the template and then I sat there and just watched my godmothers, watched my godmothers, suck balls and miners work for a while. I found it soothing to watch all that progress happening. I could see my godmothers were still taking a beating from all that rotten magic so I went back and did another triangle pass. It seemed to take forever, but when I was done, they had over 28,000 triangles. They were now my most detailed creation, and they needed every bit of it. Carl hadn't been lounging around either. He'd stored the magic they'd gained in the fight, and he'd slowly drained three more mages. All that power he was packing into his physical body, it was starting to show too. He gained about six inches in height, and lots of muscle mass. He wasn't at Hulk levels yet, but he was getting there. It was more than just his physicality. His aura was growing and becoming denser. It was developing a dark, oily look, and he was finally starting to smell like a rotten mage. 
Carl normally didn't show any emotions, but for the first time, he started looking restless. None of his old clothes fit him anymore, so he started wearing overalls. They would have been baggy on a regular person, but on him they were skin tight and the bottoms of his pants ended at his knees. He looked so powerful and I realized I probably couldn't beat him in a fight anymore. My punches had rattled his old self, but now I, wouldn't even, now I wasn't sure they would even phase him. I hadn't been paying that much attention as I'd been working on my own stuff, but it seemed like the sucker circle hadn't been used recently. As he started on his fourth mage, I saw why. The sucker mages had the sucker routine, sucker tattoos already, so he could pull from them directly. No circle needed. He talked to the mage first, and all his sucker runes lit up as he started. As they started battling for power, he had a rune on his right shoulder that he used to connect to Marius, and that's the only thing he used it for. Then he had a big one on his chest, two on his arm, and one on the inside of both legs. Of all the rotten mages I'd seen, including Marius, all the rotten mages I'd seen, including Marius, only had one sucker tattoo on them, and it was usually on their chest. One sec. I've been saying sucker runes, but Carl has sucker tattoos. I figured that having multiple tattoos gave Carl an edge in his power battles. This whole thing seemed curious, though. Why was Carl even fighting this mage for power? The mage was oath-bound for him, so he could have told the mage to just stand there and not resist. Carl seemed strangely eager. His face was flushed and his hands kept clenching, and his breathing was ragged. It was almost like he was panting. Then I realized he was excited, very excited, and not in the, hey mom, let's go for ice cream kind of way. His skin-tight overall showed he was rock hard and bulging against the denim. His Johnson had grown along the rest of his physique, and now it was massive. I felt like I was watching a train wreck. I didn't want to watch, but I couldn't look away. I knew Carl had wanted second. I knew Carl could have won in seconds, but it let the mage struggle for a couple minutes. As the mage became weaker, Carl gradually set, shut down his own sucker rings to keep the fight going. He took off his chest rune and then both arms. That just left the two on his legs. That just left the two on his legs. Or did it? I saw three strands of power. Then both of his leg tattoos shut down, which left just one strand of power heading straight, straight to the base of his throbbing beef baton. His breathing deepened and grew more labored as the power cord connecting him and his victim grew stronger. His victim started moaning loudly, and that's when I realized he was excited too. Even though the life was being sucked out of him, he looked like he was having the most erotic moment of his life. Suddenly it clicked. Isabel must have done this with Carl, except it would have been reversed and been her sucking the magic out of him. He must have been her good time boy toy. For her, he'd probably been a regular booty call with a side of kink. For him, it was probably his whole world. He didn't seem to have many emotions, and he certainly didn't seem to feel things like normal people. When he talked with Isabel, it was in worship. When he talked about Isabel, it was in worshipful terms, like she was a god and he was her human lover. I don't didn't know this for sure, but all the pieces fit. No wonder he was insanely upset at her passing. She might have been the only person in his life that had rocked his world and made him feel something. Carl was already crazy, but she'd found a way to make it worse. Just when I thought I'd figured Isabel out, I discovered another diabolical layer to her evil. This whole thing was nuts. Carl groaned as his massive member pulsed and his overalls, and his overalls picked up a wet spot. It didn't end there though as his crotch cannon reloaded and fired again. The whole cringeworthy prince process went on for another hour. I cast about desperately, looking for something, anything, to take my mind off what was happening in the room above. Upgrading all my soul creations was a worthy endeavor, so I started a template of Okta and focused every bit of my attention on making her as beautiful as possible. I didn't know how I'd, 
I don't know how I'd miss the erotic death routine with Carl's first three victims, but now I really wished I could go back and unsee everything. Working on the triangles helped, and I didn't stop until I had added over 14,000 to her design. She sparkled and twirled and looked so beautiful. I carefully checked in upstairs. Carl was now naked, Marius was cleaning his, and Marius was cleaning his body in a worshipful way. Marius seemed hungry, excited, and incredibly intense. Like psycho killer cult, let me bathe in my awakened master intense. Nope, 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 nope. I did not want to see this. I told Penny to keep an eye on them and let me know if anything dangerous happened. Then I switched off my magic sight. I felt blind and the world suddenly seemed dark and small, but it was better than having to witness whatever weird shit was getting ready to go down. I shuddered and felt like I should take a bath. Instead, I called one of my surfer dudes to my throne room and had Penny save his pattern. He had 6,045 grains of magic sand, which made sense, and he'd been my, as he'd been my most versatile and powerful creation up to this point. I zoomed in and started with just one cube. There wasn't going to be any triangles on this creation. Instead, I needed to break his grains down into even smaller, even smaller cubes. I couldn't cut the cube in half, as then I'd have two flat-looking grains. I wanted all the grains to remain a cube, which meant I needed to cut each grain along all three axes. This was going to be a heck of an up as each grain would turn into eight smaller grains. It took more time splitting the grains than doing the triangles, but I didn't want to think about what was going on up above anyway. I got into my groove and just went to town on them. It wasn't until I'd done a couple hundred grains that I realized I could spin the grain around and always cut the same way. That seemed to be faster. I did a couple hundred more grains before I realized I could use this to cut two grains at once. That worked so well, I started working with nine at a time. I was flying along now. If I could do nine, why couldn't I do a hundred? Before I knew it, I was done. Penny saved the pattern and gave me a green count. 48,360. Holy crap, that was an insane level of detail. And it had been so easy too. Since I could do a hundred at a time, I was tempted to keep going. My surfer dudes were amazingly versatile, so having high-powered versions of them would be wonderful. Penny, what's going on in the room? I asked trepidatiously. Carl is draining, is draining the last mage, and he's included Marius in his mating ritual, Penny replied matter-of-factly. He's got Marius on his knees, and he's... Stop, I commanded. Just stop. I don't need to know any more. I took a few deep breaths to let it all go. Just keep an eye on them. Let me know when Carl has his clothes back on and when they aren't touching each other anymore. Sound good? Penny nodded and I decided to go back to work on my surfer dudes. I started the next little bit of subdivision and this time I decided to push it even more. I increased the number of greens I split at once to 200, then 300, then 500. That seemed like the max I could do for now, but that was still a lot. I flew through the rest of the project and Penny saved a new template. Total grains, 386,880. I didn't realize just how much that was until I tried to fill my surfer up with magic. He just kept accepting more and more power and I finally had to stop. My surfer dudes were wonderful, but they weren't my most important peeps at the moment as they weren't contributing to my escape and they weren't part of my sabotage. They would have to wait till later to get fully filled. In the meantime, I upgraded all my dudes to the new cubes and gave them more magic than they'd started with. Penny assured me I could turn my magic sight back on again, which I did, only to see Carl and Marius headed out again. Where are they going, I asked. Carl is feeling restless and powerful, so they're going out to take down Perry and the largest group of rotten mages, Penny replied. I had about four feet of tunnel left to dig. I was getting close to my escape, but there was no way I was gonna be done before they got back. Without Marius or any of the rotten mages powering the suck balls, 
the gran granny godmother's got a chance to catch up and really clean the whole space. All that neutral magic went into Penny, and I sprinkled her with my soul, making sure her colors were fully saturated and she was in top shape. I repaired and refilled all my creations and then settled in for the wait. I felt restless. A dark cloud of dread settled over me. I was no longer sure my plane was going to work. Carl had gotten larger and more powerful than I thought possible in such a relatively short amount of time. I was afraid that after he'd won against Perry's group, he'd be so strong that dropping tons of rock on his head wouldn't stop him. He'd just crawl out and come after me like he was a Terminator. I'd fought Big Ugly and won, but his physical growth had been wild and unconstrained. He'd basically been a huge mountain of flesh and fat. Carl, on the other hand, was directing his growth. He was aiming for massive strength and power, and he was achieving it. All this doom and gloom was getting to me, and I couldn't just sit still anymore. So I got up and started running around my throne room. Penny, Eggy, and even Bermuda joined in. It just felt great to just get up and move. I needed some fun, so I made a giant feather knot, and we had a blast chasing it. Bermuda caught it easily, of course, as he had four legs to R2. I'd made the feather knot more for us than him, but he certainly enjoyed playing around with us. Bermuda was getting big, but he still had lots of kitten energy, and he was ready to run like crazy. I was shocked at how fast Penny and Eggy were. Then I realized they weren't really human and this really wasn't a real world space, so they could be as fast as they wanted to be. Actually, I could be as fast as I wanted. The only person limiting myself was me. After I realized that, I tried to let my human self go and just move. My speed doubled, then tripled, and I had to make another feather dot. This time I let it move at full speed and catching it became a challenge. Somewhere in here, I realized I could fly. I was freaking Superman. Moving at these speeds made the room feel small. I tried to push the walls back, but the size of my throne room was fixed. Still, I was flying. How awesome was that? My throne, my throne room was such an amazing space. It was the ultimate place to retreat to when I was injured or trapped. I needed to use it for more than that, though. I could make my own tool. I could make any tools I wanted here, so this place would be the ultimate workshop. Actually, I might be able to change the room completely and escape to somewhere totally different. I pushed out my thoughts and the room changed so we were now underwater. I had a coral and sand and even a sunken shipwreck. Um, are you turning this into a fish tank? My analytical side spoke up. Only for a bit I laughed and then kept going. I changed my legs to a tail and added fins on my arms. Every merboy should have beautiful long flowing, long hair to flow out behind him, so I let my luscious locks grow. I added schools of brightly colored fish and then spent a while just swimming through my new paradise. Even Bermuda got in the act as he swam by me, all four legs doing the dog paddle, or in this case, the cat paddle. I found the scene took I found the scene took effort to maintain. I wasn't really a merboy, and I didn't really live underwater, so the details faded unless I really concentrated on them. In the end, it was too much work, so I let the room revert back to its normal medieval trappings. The tapestries appeared on the walls, the red runner led up to the throne, and the chandeliers hung from the arched wooden ceiling. I read a lot of fantasy books, so this just felt comfortable to me. I did find it interesting that my throne remained even when I was underwater. It changed so it had coral and gems on it, but it was still very much a throne. I could still fly though, so I spent a while just floating in the air. It was wonderfully relaxing and I let my mind drift just like my body. I realized I hadn't slept, I hadn't felt the need, so I just kept going. My body was in a sort of stasis. so. I guess I was always sleeping. Maybe this whole thing was a dream? Nope, there was no way I was dreaming all this. I pinched myself anyway, but I didn't wake up. 
My mind drifted some more and I thought about everything that happened. All I did, and as I did, I became more and more grateful. I was grateful for my unique style of magic. It wasn't flashy or overtly powerful, but it had kept me alive. I was grateful for my house and everybody in it. I was wonderfully lucky to have a safe place to escape to. I was grateful for Bermuda and the unconditional love and acceptance he gave me. I was grateful for Penny and Eggie, for their companionship, their ideas, and their power. I was grateful for Tyler, how I'd attracted someone who was so practical and supportive and yet sexy as hell was a mystery to me. I was grateful for my marks. They were still seeds, but they had already lent me their strength and kept me calm. I was even grateful for being trapped in stone, as that had forced me to stop and work on my creations. I thought about doing that before, but life had moved too quickly. I floated there in a beautiful, serene state of mind and counted my blessings. Tyler was right. Even horrible situations become normal after a while, and you find a way to recover. I thought about Father Allring. He'd probably already figured out all the probabilities, probabilities of the possibilities in this situation. If he were here, I'm sure he could tell me down to a millionth of a percent what my odds were of getting out of this place alive. That led me to think about Mother Creation. She'd love me, regardless of how this turned out, and she'd be very practical and tell me to do my best. As I floated there, I could feel her love and it warmed my soul. I basked in that love and enjoyed my moment of peace. I was getting, it was going to get nasty soon enough. I started spinning slowly in the air so the love could hit me from all the sides. Then I flipped over to keep my love tan nice and even. It was sort of like I was in a microwave and I had a humorous thought that I was a giant burrito. Nobody wants a burrito that's hot on top, soggy on bottom and still frozen in the middle. That led me to thoughts about my lovely new kitchen. I'd love to be there right now having a real sandwich. I spun and daydream and basked in the love of mother creation. Wait a minute. I wasn't just thinking about her power. It was here. It was in this room. I hadn't noticed it before as I'd always been so busy. I kept floating, kept the good thoughts flowing, but now I actively drifted. I moved slowly but surely closer and closer to her power. Her power was up by the ceiling, so it made sense I hadn't noticed it before. Who pays attention to the ceiling? I floated and drifted towards the center of the room, higher than the chandeliers. That's when I found it, my spark of creation. It was about the size of an apple, and already it seemed sort of solid. It was perfectly round and milky white. I was very happy to notice there wasn't any trace of contamination on it. Excitement raced through me, but I tried to let it go and stay calm. I was afraid that if I lost my peaceful zen, the spark would vanish. Hello, spark, I said happily. I'm glad I found you. I wanted, I want to welcome you to my place. I hope you enjoy your time here, and I hope you grow up big and strong. Intentions were everything, so I projected thoughts of health and happiness and being home. It heard me as a ripple ran across its surface and I felt its warmth increase slightly. Before I'd even thought about it, or before I'd even thought it through, I touched it. Then I hoped I hadn't contaminated somehow, but it seemed fine. It felt a bit like a water balloon or maybe a bag of jello. It wasn't liquid, but it wasn't hard either. I guess that made sense as I was just a new mage. After it got wrapped in layers of my magic, it would probably get hard. Or maybe it just took time. Maybe it was a seed right now and it would get firm once it grew up. I seemed to have a thing for collecting seeds. Either way, I was very happy to see it was round and white, like a little baby pearl. I feel bad about how guarded I'd been with my first seed, the mark of the logarel and I wanted to make sure my spark of creation felt fully welcomed and accepted. I talked to it and told it all about me. I told it about all the things I was grateful for. I told it about my waker moment, 
fighting Isabel in the park and making my first ma first matrix. I told it how happy I was. I told it, uh, oops. I told it how happy I was sometimes, but also how angry and scared I got too. I told it about going to the gathering and I told it all about the log around and how they had given me a seat of their power. As I talked, a tiny green dot of logarel power formed in front of me. It was about the size of a pea, and when I finished my tale of the tree mages, it floated over to my spark and merged with it. I probably should have freaked out. I was messing with my spark of creation, after all. This was the thing that gave me life. It was the source of my power. If I broke it or messed it up, my life as a mage was going to be way short going to be very short. My spark seemed so happy though, and it welcomed in the leafy green drop of logarel magic. I felt no danger, but I waited for several minutes anyway, just to be sure that nothing crazy was going to happen. I breathed a sigh of relief and started to continue my story when the whole room changed. Nature in all her glory made her appearance in my throne room. Grass sprouted between the tiles on my floor. Moss grew up around the edges of the room and lichen appeared on the stone on my walls. The biggest change was the tree that grew up on the bleh, grew up the wall to the left of the throne. It was one of those tree types that is more vine than tree, and it grew up the wall and spread across part of the ceiling. The air suddenly felt fresh, like spring morning, and I felt a faint breeze. I thought the changes were finished, but a spring bubbled up and the stream and a stream flowed down the left wall and watered the roots of the tree. Leaves fell from the tree and from the ground flowers and larger grass, longer grass started to grow up around the small pond in the stream. It was like a little park setting had grown up in my throne room and I loved it. I was a bit concerned as I only had a limited amount of space. But then I noticed the wall had moved back a bit. More importantly, I could feel just how happy the mark of the logarel was now. The barrier I'd erected when it had first arrived was gone. It had moved in. It was home. I breathed and felt and loved and just took it all in for a little for a long while. This was an unexpected but welcome development. I could not only see all I could not only see my woodland area, I could feel it, and my world was better for it. Penny, Eggie, and Bermuda went over and began examining everything. Bermuda seemed excited, as there were so many new smells and new places to lay on. He laughed up water from the stream as Penny and Eggie stepped into the pond. It wasn't very deep, and it seemed like a nice place for a soak. I don't think it was their cup of tea, though as they soon got out and began checking out the flowers. Finally, I picked up my tail again, and I told my spark about meeting the deep earth and how vast and powerful it was. As I talked, a pea-sized ball of lava formed in front of me. When I finished, it floated over and merged with my spark of creation. This time, the change was instantaneous. The entire wall right wall of my throne room burst into flames and the rock changed to a dark shiny black. This time I was aware of the wall moving back, making room for what was to come next. The flames died out and this time I got a stream of lava. It flowed out of the cracks on the back part of the wall and flowed along the side before forming a small pool. An anvil made of some sort of dark midnight blue metal formed out of the ground by the pool. I didn't have to ask. I just knew I could make whatever I wanted on the anvil and I'd never get burned. I could take any metal in this place, dip it in the lava to soften it, and forge it into whatever shape I wanted. The lava was warm but comfortable. It would never hurt Bermuda or anyone else I invited into this place. I heard a happy squee as Penny and Eggie ran across the room and climbed into the lava pool. They splashed around a bit like two kids and then settled in for a nice soak. It looked like this was their new hot tub. Bermuda wandered over to check it out, but he didn't seem anywhere near as impressed. He dipped his paw in the lava, sniffed it, and then wandered back to the tree side. 
That made sense, as Penny and Aggie were made from the deep earth, so I'm sure this felt much more familiar and comfortable to them. It looked like the changes were still happening on the nature side, as I now saw some bees and butterflies flying around. Bermuda flopped down on a patch of moss and started chewing on a long stem of grass. He seemed entertained and content, so all was well with the world. I looked back to my deep earth side, and changes continued there too. Crystals were now growing up all along the stream of lava in addition to various types of metal. I saw gold and silver, those were easy to spot, but there were also different metals and shades of blue and green. Actually, I wasn't sure if they were gems or metal or whatnot, but they were very pretty. The crystals were all sorts of colors too, and many of them glowed with their own light. The lava stream was now the mirror of the nature stream with its colorful flowers and lovely grasses. I thought this would be it, but the changes continued. The shiny black wall of the deep earth changed into all the different rocks, metals, and minerals found in stone. Best of all, they all glow with colors, just like they did for my sight in the cave floor. Soon the wall was dense with all these different textures and the overall effect was just stunning. I even had precious stones like rubies, sapphires, and diamonds. It was like I had my own wall of stars and galaxies. Then I realized something else. This wall provided all the materials for my forge. If I wanted to make a silver dagger with a ruby pommel, I could. I didn't know if I could actually take it out of my throne room, but it would be fun to create. I'd enjoyed making shapes with glass. I could only imagine what, what I could make with all of this. I wish I could show my deep earth area to John. He would just freak. I was very happy with all my changes so far, and my spark of creation was now giving off a pleased purr. So I decided to keep going. Penny, Aggie, can you both come up here please, I called. They reluctantly left their new lava hot tub and floated up to see me. I want both of you to be my source of creation, I told them, gesturing to the little round seed. I'm your source, and in a very real way, this is my source. They both looked at it curiously. Penny, I'd like you to meet my spark of creation. Spark, I'd like you to meet my wonderful, awake, and aware charm, Penny. She used to be a simple Penny, but now she's full of magic and can transform into anything she wants. Penny gave it a deep bow and the spark pulsed. Then Penny reached out and touched it lightly. Oh, it's warm, and it tickles, she giggled. I guess that was all the introduction she needed as she floated back and I turned to Aggie. Aggie, I'd like you to meet my spark of creation. Spark, I'd like you to meet my second awake and aware charm. Aggie's original maker is no longer with us, although we still remember and honor his legacy. Aggie used the last of his magic to save my life, and now I'm his source. He is currently in the shape of a vase, and he travels around the house, showing off his beautiful form and lovely flowers. Aggie bowed deeply, and the spark pulsed again. It is the greatest honor to meet you, he said sincerely. I've heard of creation cores in my travel, but I never thought I'd actually meet one. I know you are small and just starting to grow, but I want to let you know that you are part of an exceptional mage. Jason has been both kind and generous to me when he had every right to be neither. He's filled me with magic and allowed me to live my dream of being a non-martial charm. I hope you grow quickly and enjoy your time together. He paused like he wanted to say more, but wasn't sure what that would be. Instead, he reached out and gently ran his fingers over the spark. Then he bowed again and floated back. I was touched by what he'd said. It had been welcoming and so supportive. It made me very glad Eggy was part of my, ma my magical crew. Bermuda had finally gotten curious about what we were up to, but so he stopped by for a visit. I introduced him to the spark as well, but he didn't seem that impressed. He sniffed it and then gave it a look like, it's a spark of creation, so what? I just laughed and kissed his head. I guessed if he couldn't eat it, play with it, or sleep on it, then it wasn't worth his time. 
He liked the kiss, so he rolled onto his back so I could love his belly. I ran my fingers through his soft fur and kissed him and loved him some more. Penny and Aggie hung around for a bit and then went back to the lava hot tub. Bermuda left soon after to take a nap. I wasn't finished talking to my spark yet, so I told it about my little soul creations and how much they'd helped me so far. Then I got the idea of talking about the runes I'd found and what they meant to me. I started with the healing rune, and I told it how I discovered just how much I liked being a healer. I talked about healing CL and L and many of the other centaurs. I also talked about the difference this rune would make for my friends in the house. Plus, I talked about how amazing it was to have my own fantastic body. T, I called. Would you mind donating one of your healing flowers to the spark? Of course not, he replied. It would be my honor. One of T's healing flowers formed in the air in front of me, and I gently nudged it towards the spark. It absorbed the flower, waited a moment, and then a large ripple flashed across its surface. Oh, I like that. My throne room felt slightly different, but I couldn't put my finger on what it was. I looked around, but I didn't see any changes. Surely that big of a reaction would have produced some sort of change in the room. I looked again, and this time I saw the healing room had been incorporated into my tree space. Little white healing flowers growing up beside the stream and around the small pool. Around the small pool, I liked it, but it seemed like such a small change for such a big reaction. I kept looking, and then I noticed the healing rune and the texture of the bark on the tree. It wasn't just in the nature area either, as I spotted the healing rune in the textures on some of the floor tiles and then in the scroll work, scroll work on my throne. So the rune was present, but it was subtle. I like that. I thought about giving the spark the light rune, as that had been my very first rune, but I decided against it. I didn't have flow or accent lines yet, and I wanted to wait until I had fully explored it. The only other rune I had with flow was the force rune, so I put together a little package for the spark. I called my surfer in and made an exact copy of his speed rune. Then I copied both my defense and attack force runes from red. Finally, I added the base force, basic force rune with all the accent lines I discovered at Biddy's. I reviewed it all again to make sure it looked good, then I pushed the runes towards the spark. Once again, it waited for a moment and then gave a big ripple. This time, I knew to look for small, subtle changes, and I found them everywhere, especially on the wall of the deep earth. I guess that made sense, as it's all about heat and pressure. The basic force room was on the anvil, as well as reflected in the crystals and metals along the lava stream. The whole wall, with all its elements and colors, now reflected the force room. Some of the tiles on the floor now had the force rune, and it was also included in the scroll work on my throne. It was so neat because the more I looked around, the more I saw the force rune or the healing room subtly, in, subtly embedded into the throne room. It was kind of like looking for hidden Mickeys at Walt Disney World. Once you started looking, you, they seemed to pop up everywhere. I flew back down to the ground and looked around my transformed space. It was wonderful. When I'd first come here, I'd felt like my throne room was ready for me to move in. Well, now I'd moved in. I walked around the room admiring everything. I ran my fingers over the bark on the tree, smelled the flowers, had a drink from the stream, carefully touched the lava, and admired my wall of rock. One thing I was happy to see was that my banners were still here. They just relocated to the other two walls. I sat on my throne for a while, this was my throne room after all, but it, it didn't feel any different and I quickly became bored. So I walked back to my human-sized cat bed and curled up with Bermuda. And this ends our chapter. And so next we have Breakout. Mm -hmm. I guess you can determine from the title what that's all about. All right, guys. See you all next week.